Hi everybody, it's John Bank with another model in box review. Um, what we're looking at here is an image of the German... Um, she was classed as a protective heavy cruiser, but she was coined um, by, the Germ uh, by the British Navy as a pocket battleship because she had the armament of a if you like a sort of world war one battleship and she had the armor and protection of a world war one battleship but she had the speed and maneuverability of a cruiser the ship we're looking at is actually the admiral graf spey and we're doing a an inbox review on a model i'll be building of the admiral graf spey but it's not the airfix kit which a lot of people might think it's actually the Matchbox kit, PK161, <clears throat> and this forms a, another part of the uh, the Matchbox array of models that I'll be doing in box reviews and builds on. The thing is, a lot of people uh, may or may not realise, but there were actually three ships built in the class of the pocket battleships. They were actually Deutschland class heavy cruisers. Um, the first ship being, of course, called the KMS Deutschland. Um, the second ship that was launched was the Admiral Graf Spey, and the Admiral Scheer was the third ship launched. Not quite sure which order they were actually completed and sea trialled in, um, but I do know that there was an issue with the Deutschland. Um, not in technical terms, it was more along the lines of what Hitler wanted to call a ship. Hitler had plans to build a third and fourth Bismarck class battleship. Um, and he also had plans to build a super battleship, which would have been a much larger version of the Bismarck class. And he earmarked one of the Bismarck class built ships, the third and fourth ships. One of them was to be called the Deutschland. And so the name that was awarded to the uh, the heavy cruiser Deutschland class ship came as Deutschland. The ship was renamed the Lutzo, um, which was a bit confusing because the the Germans had already had um, a hipper class cruiser, heavy cruiser, armed with eight eight inch guns, which was also called the Lutso. But that ship was sold to the Russian Navy prior to her being completed. Um, and the ship was sent off to the Soviet Union in 1940 uh, to be completed by the, the Russians. And that ship was renamed um, a Russian name. Can't remember exactly what the ship was called, but the name, um, Deutschland, uh, sorry, the name Lutzo, which was on that particular cruiser, was then reassigned to a, the KMS Deutschland, the ship became KMS Lutzo. And I just want to show you, um, I'm going to show you the boxing history first. Actually, how am I going to show you the boxing history? That's, that's the first image of the ship. Um, let's just take that off. What I want to do, yeah, first of all, I want to show you the differences between the three different ships, the four names and the three different ships. The DKM Admiral Graf Spey, which was launched on May in May 1936, um, looked like this, and she had a she, she was the ship that was most unlike the other two. She had a proper conning tower, and she had um, proper branches off the conning tower, with a totally redesigned forward superstructure, different to the other two ships. Um, Admiral Scheer which I think is the next image, she had, originally she was launched with a spindle type uh, conning tower, um, but this was replaced by a more boxy style conning tower, similar to Graf Spey, in about 1930, uh, sorry, 1940. But the ship was um, redesigned around the spindle conning tower again in around about 1943. Um, and the DKM Admiral Shear looks like this. She also had a rate uh, bow, and she had a a stack uh, angled stack top to her as well, which made her look quite different to uh, to the Admiral Graf Spey. But she was more along the lines of the Admiral Graf Spey, but sort of had a forward superstructure similar to the Lutzo. The Deutschland, which was launched in 1936, I believe, and completed in 1939. She originally had um, a, um, a, a side view similar to the uh, the Admiral Shear with um, a non-raked bow, 
But then in 1941, she was given a raked bell and um, a splinter camouflage. And then in 1944, she was given um, an angled top to the, the stack. And she eventually looked more like the Shia than she did her own identity. Um, but originally she had she was the ship that was far removed from the other two in, in terms of what she, she actually looked like from the side. Um, the interesting thing about the Shia and the and the Lutso is that they um, were basically used in the Norwegian campaign against the British and American convoys to the Soviet Union. Um, and then later in the war, in about 1944 to 45, these two ships were used to bombard the advance of the Russian um, advance on Germany to try and hold up the Russian advance, and they were both eventually sunk by the RAF. Um, right, boxing history. Boxing history starts in 1977 with this style of box. Um, it's an op it's um, an open-ended box, so the box opens at one end, like most of them did at this sort of period. And the way you tell a Type 1 box as opposed to a Type 2, sorry, a first release box as opposed to a second release box is that in the um, description here, you've got Admiral Graf Bay in quite large white letters underneath the Matchbox logo. And then you've got a Waterline 700 scale two color model kit written underneath Admiral Graf Bay. Um, and then there's some gumph and ev information on the ship in the top right hand corner and also um, this is a throwback to, and I'll explain when I get to the second slide if you notice it's very poignant to notice this but the guns on the first release box the guns were firing and her secondary guns were firing and there are definitely splashes of like bomb splashes in the water especially around her stern there you can see them quite evidently now in 1979, when the second release kit was launched, this is the second release, and this is the model that I've got a boxing of to review, uh, there was a law passed in 1979 which stopped um, toy companies advertising scenes of violence or war on any, of, any item that they sold that could be justified as being a toy in the United Kingdom. And this meant that the original image with the guns firing and the splashes of water as bombs fell around the Grafsch Bay had to be removed and they actually had to photoshop the original image um, and remove all of the gun flashes from the secondary armament and the main firing guns and all of the the bomb splashes in the water behind her stern and there was even a little one at the front here if you remember a little tiny one there and the second generation box release the Admiral Graf Bay is written in smaller white letters um, and there's a 1700 scale symbol uh, stuck on the left hand side of the Admiral Graf Bay mark but it's still written underneath the Matchbox logo and this information has been taken away and I think it's now put onto the ship's instruction leaflet what was written on there before I think it was on the original instruction leaflet as well but it, it wasn't printed on the front box anymore 1979 was also a release date for the AMT release um, this time in America they were calling the ship the Admiral Graf Bay pocket battleship molded in two colours. There's no sign whatsoever of the fact that the ship uh, was 1700 scale but an interesting thing to note is that for the American market they retained the original artwork with the firing guns and all of the splashes around the ship and the secondary armament firing there and I always thought that was quite interesting and quite in, quite poignant. Um, it's quite a nice image, the, you know, the, the artist has drawn and painted quite a nice image of the Grash Bay there, which is quite nice to see. So that was a co-release in 1979 for the American market for AMT and Matchbox of the Admiral Grash Bay. Now in 1988, um, Revell was starting to get interested in marketing ma Matchbox kits, and I think they probably had a pretty good idea they were going to take the company over eventually. But it was around about nine or ten years before they eventually purchased Matchbox Lock, Stock and Barrel. And the serial number was changed from PK161 to 40161. And it's interesting to note that the 40 was the prefix numbers given by Revell to Matchbox models. But they had to retain the 161 PK numbers. And also when you look at the sprues in these kits you can see that 40161 
wasn't the original uh, serial number because it's printed on the sprues. And you'll see it clearly when I show you the, uh, the kit. But the sprues inside this box are exactly the same colour, they're exactly the same sprues. They've just had um, some items of information removed from them, I think like Made in England and things like that. Or may maybe not in this release because it's still a Matchbox release kit. But the black border uh, windows around the artwork, and notice that they've chosen completely new artwork for the Grash Bay model kit here. The ship's even facing a completely different direction. Um, I think you know that this black window around the box is definitely a forerunner of the fact that Revell were going to take the company over at the time. That's 1998, the box release. And then something weird happened. In 2001, 40161, which was the, um, the, the revised number, if you like, serial number for the model, was released um, as a Revell kit through Alanga. And in 2001, I think you'll find that Revell actually owned a Matchbox, but Alanga were um, a Far Eastern export um, company that Revell used to sell a lot of Matchbox and Revell kits. And yeah, it's quite interesting because they've used the image which is similar to, um, it's not the same, but it is similar to the original box artwork. And I always found that quite interesting. Also, the colour scheme that's depicted on the Alanga kit um, and the Matchbox kit to a certain extent, I'm not sure if that colour scheme actually existed. Because in the Battle of the River Plate, um, there's not a lot of people realise this, but when German ships went to the Atlantic, they were coated entirely in battleship grey. All of their standard camouflage, the Baltic scheme splinter camouflage, and any combat camouflage was removed in the hope that the German ships would look more like Royal Naval ships in the North and South Atlantic. And it would be a lot longer before the Royal Navy could identify the ship as being an access force vessel. But that was on a Langer release in 2001. Um, and I think that is the last release of this kit um, through Revell of the Matchbox Graf Spey. Um, right. There's a nice image here. This is a colorized original black and white image of the, um, the Graf Bay actually sailing under a bridge and I'm not quite sure, can't remember exactly where this was. Um, I think it's in a canal in Germany. Can't remember exactly but it's a nice colorized image. The original was black and white but they've colorized this image and it's actually a nice nice picture they've done. I think it might have been part of a video um, which was used for, I don't know, maybe a, a wartime documentary, but it's colourised in colour and it's quite nice, quite a nice image that. Uh, so anyway, that's the Graf Bay, that's the boxing history. Let's just pan the camera down so we can have see what we've got here. I don't want to... Whoops, God, this camera stand is a nightmare. Right, that should stay. Let's get this wire out of the way, because I'm going to get that out of the way for you. This is the box we've got here. This is a second generation release box where all the, the evidence of war and violence was removed from the artwork, as you can see there. On the front, you've got um, the, the fact that this ship is the first model, PK-161, in the orange range of vessels. Um, the orange range and the purple range weren't just... Um, they weren't just applied to aircraft. They were actually applied to their military armour and their ships as well. Um, on the on the this side image, you've got some of the uh, the suggested colours and paint schemes for the ship that you can paint, and on the back you've got an image of the ship as it would look like if you didn't put any paint on her at all in the two colours that are provided in the plastic on the sprue, which is quite nice. I think that's always quite nice. We'll open the box up so you can have a quick look. I was quite surprised when I got this ship and I had a look at what was inside because what you've got inside the box was actually quite remarkable. You know, Matchbox models have got this thing about being basic kits, about being not an awful lot to them, but their naval ships are actually quite good. Now then, the instruction leaflet. The instruction leaflet opens up to an unusual shape. It's not quite A4, but it's definitely bigger than A5. And you've got um, on the front cover here, you've got a repeat of the box artwork and some stats there on the left hand side and the PK161 number and the ship's name and everything. And on the top of the, uh, the instruction leaflet, you've got some 
paint instructions and call outs. Um, I think those call out numbers are actually Humbrol Heller numbers. Sorry, Humbrol um, paint numbers, which is quite interesting. Um, yeah, so that's and on the top. Just just to let you know, on the top here, you've got a complaints slip here built into the instruction leaflet. And the idea is, if you had a part missing or damage, you cut that piece away and um, away away you send off for the bits you need. Now then, on the back of the instruction leaflet, you've got different um, languages with information on the kit, uh, which is quite nice. Bits of stats and history, and then you've got um, a colour call out and paint guide for the ship on the back as well, which is quite interesting. I'm pretty sure these colours weren't used for the Battle of the Red Plate, but they might have been used when she was, you know, involved in her sea trials or whatnot, which is quite good. Now the instruction leaflet actually builds the ship up in 14 stages, and as you can see from the instructions. This kit is not basic, it's actually quite detailed, and I found this about HMS Ariadne. I'm building the Ariadne at the moment, she's nearly finished actually, nearly ready for paint. And the thing I found about these kits is although they're small, they're actually quite detailed. Um, there's quite a lot going on on their decks, and this kit is no exception. The, um, the sections 1, 2, 3 and 4 are all sub-assemblies prior to um, getting the deck cleaned up and getting the guns assembled but basically you've got a boat a couple of boats in three and four you've got the secondary armament in section one and the primary armament in section sorry secondary armament in section two and the primary armament in section one they were 11 inch guns on the Graf Bay, and all of the Deutschland class had 11 inch guns in section six you're putting the hull together and the rear quarter deck there that goes together as well the guns will actually rotate um, they have retainers on the underside of the deck's hull of the of the deck to hold the guns in position and allow them to rotate in section seven there you've got um some of the rear superstructure and the it's like a boat deck if you like section eight you're building the main stack and section nine you're building the conning tower and the grass spray had a very distinctive conning tower different to the others um yeah, which was very interesting and section 10 you're basically marrying all these sub assemblies up together on the forward superstructure um deck with a few boats and bits and bobs and pieces here and there and a radar housing there at the front there part 37 and then in, in section 11 you're putting all of that onto the ship's deck with the secondary armament and the torpedo tubes at the back yes the ship did have torpedo tubes and there's even two part 73 there there are two ladders that go onto the quarter deck from the up the upper deck um, this ship is very detailed and then in section 12 you've got some anti-aircraft fittings there and an Arado uh, spotter plane with twin floats which is quite nice and then in section 14 you're just basically finishing off putting the last final bits and bobs on and you're actually putting a flag on which comes complete with a kit but uh, unfortunately I don't think I've got the decal in here there's no decal sheet or paper flag for that whatsoever in here it must have been must have gone missing now then the parts there's no transparencies or decals in this kit whatsoever. Um, and I'm just going to quickly show you the parts. The kit comes in two colours. A sort of a dark grey and a black. Which is quite nice. I think the ship always came in these two colours. I don't think the ship came in any other colours other than this. Um, which is quite nice. It looks, you know, it looks the part. It's going to build nice. The things I wanted to show you, I'm just going to show you the actual intricacy of the detail on this kit because it's actually quite incredible. And also, this is something else as well which is quite interesting. When you buy a Matchbox release of a Revell, sorry, a, rele a Revell release of a Matchbox kit, the sprue will be exactly the same. And I don't know if you can see that. I'm trying to get that to focus in, but it says made in England. PK161. Now, when Revell remodeled, remarketed these kits, they actually removed Made in England from the sprue. They just covered it in a piece of, they probably scraped it away from the mold so that it would get filled up with plastic um, in order to make people realize that these kits weren't made in England anymore. They were actually made in Germany. Um, but you can still see the PK-161 on the sprues, or the PK whatever number it was for Matchbox as well, and that goes with any of their um, old tall Matchbox kits that are re released through uh, Revell boxings. The main hull 
It's waterline, of course, as you can see. The main hull is actually quite nicely detailed with some nice port holes. Um, there's some nice stuff going on there with, with this part. It looks quite nice, doesn't it? And the intricacy and fineness of the detail in the, in the parts, they're really very finely moulded, aren't they? They look very, very nice. And this was not something that a lot of people associated with Matchbox kits, is the fact that their parts were so finely rendered and the kit was could be quite detailed but the naval ships were that's that sprue i'm not going to show you this this whole piece because there's no point and this basically is just the the filler for the underside of the hull um there's some information written there as well um it's not going to come into focus very easily which is a shame there we go coming in there there we go it's just some information written on the, the back of the, the hull um, and then you've got another another sprue with more parts on it. There's some cranes there which are nicely moulded. They look quite nice. Some boats which have the, the runners going across the middle of them. There's the main guns. Mast set mast piece there. There's the torpedo tubes. Quite nicely moulded as well. I like the look of this. These kits, this kit's parts look really nice. Um, yeah, Matchbox didn't do a bad naval ship, did they? And the black sprue. Again, this is nicely moulded too. Yeah, the deck. This is the main deck. You have to remember that these pocket battleships were actually very heavily armoured. Um, they were a tough nut to crack. Certainly more than a match for all three of the cruisers the, uh, the Royal Navy sent out to sink her in the Battle of the River Plate. She was... She was such that she actually virtually blew Exeter out of the water. She had to go back to break off engagement and go back to Britain and uh, undertake repairs. And she was later sadly sunk in the war. Um, these parts, you know, you've got some superstructure and upper deck mountings there and some superstructure mountings. And there's the conning tower. The bridge windows are quite nicely rendered there. They're quite nice. The parts are very nice. The main armament turrets there. They're very finely rendered, very, very nicely cast. I think it's going to look very nice. That's the quarter deck there. I think the parts are going to look pretty good. So that's the. Um, that's a look at the parts. Um, I think you'll agree that the, the Matchbox... Well, I mean, I found this with all of the naval models that you get from Matchbox. The parts are very finely rendered. They're, they're nicely cast on the sprues. And the kit does seem to have a lot more detail than you would normally associate with a Matchbox kit. Um, so we'll just put this up together and I'll just put that on the side there so you've got something nice to look at whilst I just read this gump out. Now what I've done with the options and costs on this, this review is I've included the other two stroke three ships as part of an options and costs because some companies actually do all three different ships even though there are four names for them. The Lutzo and the Deutschland were actually the same vessel. Was just, she was just renamed, as I said before. The kit we're doing a review on is the Matchbox Admiral Graf Spee, serial numbered PK161, and the ship's moulded in 1700 scale waterline. The dimensions of the kit are 10 inches long by about 1.25 inches beam by 2 inches high to the top of the mast. There are 88 parts on two dark grey green plastic sprues and 42 parts on a black plastic sprue completing 130 parts in total. Now the options and costs, they go from about 1 1200 scale up to about 1 100 scale. So, you know, they do go from quite a small kit to quite a large one. In 1 1200 scale, there's a company called Eagle Wall, and they build a large number of different, raw, um, different naval ships, access and allied vessels, name, mainly from World War II. And they build all three of the different pocket battleships. They build the Admiral Graf Spee, the Admiral Scheer, and the Lutzo. Um, but I don't think they do a separate boxing for the Deutschland. I think the Lutzo is just, you know, the, the kit you get. And those models all retail for anything between 3 and 15 quid, depending on the condition of the box. Some of them are quite old. And if they're in good condition, they can fetch at least £15, sometimes even more. In one eight hundredth scale, Limburg do an Admiral Graf Spee. Not sure of the costings on that, but to be honest with you, I wouldn't worry about it. 
1720 uh, skill, Italier Rai did an Admiral Graf Spee and a Deutschland for 15 to 30 pound, and Italieri did an Admiral Graf Spee, an Admiral Schier, a Lutzo and a Deutschland, which were reboxed Italier Rai kits for 15 to 22 pound. Ravel also did uh, an Admiral Graf Spee, which was a reboxed Italier Rai kit for about 10 to 20 pound. And testers did an Admiral Graf Spee and a Deutschland, which was the old Italieri kit. Um, no details on the costings of those. The thing you have to remember is, is that I've not seen anywhere that um, the the Deutschland and the Graf Spee from the Revel, uh, sorry, the Deutschland and the Graf Spee from the testers kit um, is actually the same as the Italieri kit. But scale mates state that it is, but I have had a look at some photographs of the sprues and I think they've been altered slightly. And I'm not sure how many parts have been altered, but I'm pretty sure they've been altered in order to reenact the, the forward strake. Don't quote me 100% on this, but I have seen a picture of some sprues somewhere online and it does suggest this. In 1700 scale, Combrick did a model of the Lutzo, no pricings on that. Flyhawk also did a model of the Lutzo, I've got no pricings on that. But Fujimi did an Admiral Graf Spee and an Admiral Shear for about ten to twenty-five pound. The matchbox kit of the Graf Spee is about twelve to twenty pound, and Trumpeter do an Admiral Graf Spee for about ten to fifty-four pound, depending on the age, quality, and the completeness of the kit. The Alanga X uh, matchbox release of Admiral Graf Spee is about ten to fifteen pound, and Pitt Road did an Admiral Graf Spee, which was a rebox Trumpeter kit, for about fifteen to twenty-two pound. 1600 scale, um, Airfix did an Admiral Graf Spee for 12 to 50 pound, Aurora did an Admiral Graf Spee for 5 to 50 pound, and MPC reboxed the Admiral Graf Spee from Airfix for 10 to 20 pound. In 1500 scale, Nachimo did an Admiral Graf Spee, no pricings on that, and in 1400 scale, CC Lee did an Admiral Shear and a Graf Spee, again, I've got no pricings on that. But Hella reboxed both of these two kits from CC Lee and they retail for about 10 to 40 pound. In one 350 scale, there are two very nice kits one from Academy of the Graf Spee for 32 to 38 pound, and the Trumpeter kit of the Graf Spee is about 41 to 90 pound. But believe it or not, there is actually a one 100 scale model from a company called Scale Shipyards. And Admiral Graf Spee, the Admiral Shear, and the Lutzo can all be modelled from the same hull, but they have different um, sprues for the deck details and the superstructure. Now then, conclusions. I wanted to include, sorry, I wanted to include all three of the Deutschland class ships in the options, as they are so similar, with only some minor changes in the Deutschland and Lutzo ship. The matchbox kit looks really nice and surprisingly detailed, and doubtless to say the fit should be good and the kit should be an easy and fun build. Models worthy of note are the Academy, and more so the Trumpeter offerings in 1350th scale, and for the smaller scales, the Matchbox and Airfix kits look reasonable choices. The Fujimi and the Italieri boxings look pretty good for the money too, but steer clear of the Aurora kit, as it's a bit on the crude side, and the Limburg model, well, the less said about that, the better. So this is the... Um, the model review finished for the Admiral Graf Spee. I hope this video is going to be of some use to anyone who's interested in um, looking at maybe a Graf Spee for a project. Um, as is with always, if you've got any questions, crews, just pop them in the, the, uh, the comments um, boxes underneath this video and I'll try and get back to you with an answer as quickly as possible. Hope all your modelling projects are running smooth and uh, thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you for the next one. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.